I think I'll use this mic tonight because it sounds louder, right? No, I'm not. I'm, I'm going to give you one. But I like to sing with it. God tells us what it looks like. The Bible tells us what it looks like. There's a lot of information there in the Bible, and if we just uh, allow it to, to, to us to be able to see through the God, through the Word of the Lord things that are He wants us to hear and see and understand, <coughs> it's so important as we as Christians have to understand that there's a lot of stuff going to happen in the future. There's a lot of stuff going to happen when we get when we get to heaven. So, what does heaven look like? What does the Bible say about it? In 1 Corinthians two verse nine. This is one of my most favorite verses because I know that if I let it touch my heart, the way it should touch your heart, but it says this, I have not seen, nor ear heard, neither entered into the heart of man the things which God had prepared for him that love him. Just think of all the things that God has already, we, we know the Bible, we read pretty much, and this is not a, a subject that we, you haven't touched on, Bill's preached on this. I don't know how many times, maybe a hundred. But anyway, this is something we as Christians need to get a hold of this. We need to understand all the things that this is talking about, especially in 1 Corinthians when it's talking about, I have, we haven't seen it. We haven't, we, there's no way we can comprehend it. All the beauty that's around us, and we see all the things that are out there, we see those things, but that will not hold a candle to what Jesus has got for us when we get to heaven. And that's going to be a time when we get there. And all the things that we hear, and with the things that we hear and, and, and that are going on around us with, with uh, nature and, and the birds. And, and I, I like to sit on the back porch and listen to the birds and listen to the, to the, uh, the, the bees and, and, and all the other little things that are out there, the squirrels. And, and I was sitting out there the other day, and I told Linda, I said, I hear a squirrel. I can't see him, but I hear him. I know he's in that tree up there. And pretty soon, sure enough, he comes down the tree. I said, there he is. I, that, that's the hunter in me, I guess. You know, always my, my, my dad and, and Linda's dad used to love to hunt squirrels, yeah. and that's that was a, their major uh, source of meat was rabbits and squirrels, right, baby? And so uh, I'm glad I don't have to do that. Mm-hmm. I'm glad I don't have to do that one more. Okay. Have to hunt that for meat, but I'll, anyway, some say that the, that verse means that God has prepared things for those who love Him that cannot be known through the eyes, ears, and mind. Others say that this means that heaven will be better than anything that we've seen or heard before. And in the realities, God has planned for those who love him and follow him. And it's going to be incredible. It's going to be absolutely incredible. Because we can't, you can't picture it. You, you can't even get it in your mind. Right. It's not there. Because the things that we have here on this earth and the things that we can see every day with these eyes and the things that we hear every day, that's going to be nothing about when we get to heaven. The things that he has prepared for us. That's, that's going to be a great time, folks. That's going to be something to look forward to is having to be able to see all that God has prepared for us because he loves us and the things he's done for us. The Bible provides several vivid descriptions of heaven, particularly in the book of Revelations. According to Revelation uh, chapter 21 and 22, heaven, or the New Jerusalem, is depicted as a stunning, beautiful city coming down from God. Right. It's described as having the streets of gold, pearls, gates of pearls, the walls made of jasper, precious stones, and this city is said to be brilliantly illuminated by the glory of God. Right. By the glory of God. Obliviating the need for the sun or the moon. They're not going to be, we're not going to need the sun or the moon because we've got the, the, the glory of God that will be there. And his glory will shine all over heaven. And any, any, anywhere you're there, anywhere you're at in heaven, you're going to be able to see his glory. There's also a river of water of life 
as clear as crystal flowing from the throne of God and the Lamb to the middle of the city by the main streets. Additionally, the Bible mentions that heaven is a place where there's no more death. Wow. There'll be no more death. There'll be no more sorrow. There'll be no more crying. And there'll be no more pain. Isn't that something to think about? With all the things that we have to endure here on this earth. And been to funerals here lately. A lot of them like been having to go to these funerals because of uh, deaths in people's family. And that always brings sorrow to people. To me, when I see it, I glory. If I know they're Christian here, I know they're Christians, I glorify with them knowing that I know where they're at. Hopefully, I know where they're at. But they're supposed to know where they're at. But anyway, because of that, there'll be no more death. And there'll be no more sorrow. How many times in our life have we gone through trials and tribulations in our life that has just caused so much sorrow in our life? There'll be no more. We will have no more sorrow to worry about. And there'll be no more crying. And there'll be no more pain. I was thinking about the other day. I had to go to the doctor again today for this stupid uh, leg treatment they'd be doing. And I said, one day, I won't have to do that no more. Bill won't have to do that to go to the doctor and cross these at None of us are going to have to do, do that anymore because God has promised that we are not going to have to endure any of that anymore. It suggests an existence that is entirely free from suffering and trials on this earth. We're not going to have those trials. We're not going to go through the same things that we, go, we have gone through down here. Never, never again because we're going to be in heaven and we're going to be in heaven with God. And that's going to be such a great time when we get there. The overarching theme in the one of the, is the eternal peace and joy in the presence of God. When we get to be in God's presence and feel His peace. That only He can give. You know, you go to funerals and you pray, when we pray for people, that, that you, you, God give them a special peace. You know, we pray for them when a person gets ready to die, that God gives them that dying grace, that dying peace that only He can give. To help other people, too, because they're having to deal with the people that are going on before. And, you know, He gives us that eternal peace and that eternal joy in the presence of God. In His presence, there is the eternal peace. There, there where the redeemed of the Lord will live in perfect harmony with Him and with each other. You know, down here, some of us can't live yet because we just got other things going on in our lives, right? And we always got something that we may don't like about somebody. And so we hold, maybe hold a little bit of a grudge or something like that. But anyway, when we get to heaven, we're going to have perfect harmony. We're going to be with loving each other and, and, and having time to spend with each other and just being there with that special peace that only God can give. And with all, any, all, other, all the other people that will be there. Because there's people I know right now that, you know, I love them to death, but I still have sometimes I have the reservations about the things and the way they do things. But you know what? When we get to heaven, we're going to have that great harmony mm-hmm. and we won't have to worry about that, that stuff anymore. These descriptions serve convey heaven's splendor and its grandeur. I've been fortunate over the years that I've lived on this earth, for 71 years now, and uh, to be able to to see the things that this world has to offer. Uh, I see the breathtaking mountains, and we always talk about this, but I was, we were coming back from the doctors today, and when you go over that hill, you can see those beautiful mountains. When I first came here to, uh, to the valley, the first thing that I saw was those mountains. When I went over that hill, the bad part is when you get to our house, you can't see because the trees are up. Because we're up and the trees are there. But when you go down down by the uh, uh, the place there, by Target's uh, distribution center, go there through there and go over top of that hill. And as soon as you get to the top of the hill, you can see how beautiful those mountains yeah. are. But you know what? They're not going to be nothing compared to what God's going to have for us. And I love them. I love them. I love to see them every time I go over them. But then I also think about, wow. What's God got prepared for us? What's God going to give us to be able to see and to be able to hear? And that's going to be a great time when we able to see those things and, and be with Him during that time. I, uh, when we go, sometimes we see the Blue Ridge Mountains, and I can look out the back window of my house, and I can still see the mountains as long as I cut the trees down, the bushes down. I have to cut the bushes down because we sit on the back porch. The bushes are too high. So I'll just go out there and start cutting them down. Now, the lady who does behind me, she don't like that a lot because uh, actually she don't want to see us on the porch. So, but I cut the bushes down just high enough so I can see the see the mountains in the background. And, you know, I love to see them. And outside, 
and they're just outside the back part of our window. When we hit, when we went to California uh, with a group, we went out there and we were flying over the flying over the, the cities and all, and over the hills and the dells and all the stuff there. And I looked down at that ground and I thought, wow, if, if heaven's anything like this, that's going to be glorious. And uh, I know it's not going to be anything like this. It's going to be a whole lot better. And I can imagine that. But anyway, I saw the water, beautiful waterfalls, and I saw saw the beautiful forest and, and God's creation is so marvelous. As you look at it, if you're just taking it in perspective and see all the things that are out there that God has for us right now and enjoy those things that God has for us right now and think about all the things that he's going to give us one day and we're going to review it then. But there is a future place in eternal dwelling far exceeding anything that we can be holding. Anything can be holding. Heaven is not a mythological place. It's the glory. It's a holy dwelling of the Lord Most High. That's where he's at. Although we can't even begin to comprehend the splendor, the Bible gives us a beautiful description of the place in which those who have received Jesus Christ will be for all of eternity. Only those that are only those that have accepted him as their Lord and Savior will ever be able to see these wonders that he has for us. So we as Christians may be more uh, willing to go out and tell other people because we want to get them to go with us. I want my family to go with me. I want my friends to go with me that I had known for years and years. I want those people to go with me and see all these blessings that God has for me and has done that's going to be for me. I'm going to give you some beautiful descriptions of heaven from the Bible. These can be uh, can give us a better idea of what heaven really, really looks like. The first one is this. Heaven has mansions where we'll dwell with Jesus forever. He said in, uh, in John 14, 2 and 3, he says, In my Father's house are many mansions. If I were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. You know what? On my trip to the doctors today, I got to thinking, I go to the doctors a lot. Bill goes to the doctors a lot. <laughs> so anyway, but on my way to the doctors this morning, uh, I came across these beautiful houses. They're all, they all belong along that back street as you go, like you're going out to 250, and uh, just, just beautiful, beautiful houses. I call them mansions. I got a shack compared to them things, you know. But I see those mansions, and I thought, wow, those things are just absolutely beautiful. And the place was dotted with the, the land, beautiful landscaping. And you look out over the hills, and you can see the foothills and see how beautiful that they are. And considered, But I considered a mansion, and I thought they, would, they, they are mansions that, that I consider to be mansions. But I know they don't even come close to the mansions that God's prepared for me and prepared for the saints in heaven. And they're beautiful. But you know what? They they're, they're probably like slums. You need to actually think about their slums compared to what God has for us. Both his death, Jesus confronted his disciples with the promise that he would go and provide a place for them. The most beautiful part of it was the assurance that he would return for them and receive them into his son. Aren't you glad that he said, I'm, he told the disciples, I'm coming back. And that's what our hope is. That's what our joy is to believe that he is coming back. Just like he told the disciples. I'm coming back to get you. He's coming back to get us and to take us home to a place that will be better than anything else that we can possibly imagine. Right. No matter how spectacular the mansions are in our Father's house, dwell with Jesus will be the best, most beautiful habitation of all. When we get to see Jesus and just be with him and go to heaven and walk through those pearly gates or walk through the gates and see Jesus. What a sight that's going to be. Just think about that. Everything else is not going to matter. All the things that are around you are not going to matter. Because guess what? You're going to see Jesus. And that's going to be one of the greatest things, the most beautiful things that can happen. And he welcomes us into heaven, by the way. He will, we will be walk, welcomed into heaven by the way, the truth, and the life. will be the culmination of the hope that we have in Christ. We'll be all because of that. Because he loves us so much. What a day that'll be. What a day of rejoicing that's going to be when we see Jesus. I like I like that song that we sang a little while. What a day that's going to be when my Jesus I shall see. And I look upon his face because he's going to save me by his grace. And then he's going to come take me by the hand. He's going to lead me to the promise. And what a day. A glorious day that's going to be. Heaven will be a city built for worship. 
Hebrews 12, 22 through 22 says this, But you have come to Mount Zion and in the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and the church of the firstborn, who are written in heaven and of God, the judge of all, of the saints, of the just men, made perfect. This Bible passage is such a, a beautiful and it's a rich passage because it describes in the details and description of heaven the city of the living God. It's a city of the living God will be a spectacular place according to God's perfect design. He's made it. He's got He's got on his hand. Just think about it. When, and when we first created the heavens and the earth and all the things and all the stars and all the things that are out there, how beautiful that probably was to him when he first when he first created it. But then guess what? He's got something even better than that for us to see when we get to heaven we'll be, and we will be with him forever and ever. And it's a, it'd be a spectacular place according to God's perfect design. And as one writer one writer put it, the heavenly Jerusalem will be a place of unimaginable blessings. He's going to bless us like you've never, never thought about being blessed. All the things he wants to give us and help us and, and show us and get us to, to help us better uh, to enjoy all that he's got there for us. But he's got these unimaginable blessings that he has for us and he wants us to have. Those registered, listen to me, those registered in heaven have been made perfect by Jesus' sacrifice on the cross will assemble with him an innumerable company of angels before their most holy God. I've made my reservations. Have you made your reservations? Have you made your reservations? Because guess what? He's coming back. And he's coming back sooner than people think. And you better be ready. Because you never know. You never know when he's, he's going to come back. And he's going to take you out of this life. I, I, I saw something on the news the other day. There was a, a, a young boy. And, and he was in the back seat of a car. And dad was driving the car. And all of a sudden, he went through the light. The light was green. But the other side, the guy's light was red. He was one of the great big trucks, and he ran right through that light. He killed that little boy. The dad made it because he felt it was back far enough on the car, but he killed the little boy. The dad was so sad, but you know what he knew? He knew that that little boy had gone to church, accepted the Lord as a Savior, and so that just made it a little bit easier. It, that could be good. Losing a child is never easy. But you know what? Knowing where he's at. Amen. Knowing where he's at, that's what's important. And that's what we need is if we need Christians can understand that. That we made our reservations. Uh, today, okay, come on, back to the doctor again. Come back to the doctor again. I went back to the doctor. And while I was there, there was a lady in there that was doing her thing on my legs and all that. And so I actually got a chance to talk to her and, you know, and give her the plan of salvation and all that. And uh, so she was talking about it because I told her what I was going to talk about tonight. I was talking about heaven. So she had all these questions, you know, all these questions about heaven, this, 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 heaven, this, this. Yeah, yeah, that's right, that's right, that's right. But do you know that you know that you know that you're going to heaven? Because that's where you want to go. You want to go and see and experience all the things that you that you and me are talking about. You want to experience those things, but you'll never experience it if you don't accept it as your Lord and Savior. And so it was just a, you know, a grand time. I was just sitting there. I was, I was, you know, way high because she was saying she kept she kept putting out the questions, and I kept giving her the answers. To so and that's a good thing. But you know what? Every one of us need to be that way, uh, to be trying to reach as many people as we can uh, for the Lord. Mm -hmm. To try and picture the multitude spread uh, out before the, the living God is amazing and altogether incomprehensible. Mount Zion, the city of David, and the eternal uh, possessions of the God Most High will be in the holy city, and they'll all be assembled there to worship. We'll all be there to worship God and, and, and come before Him. That's just something that we all need to think about. And one day we will all be before him, and we will all be worshiping him. At this time, uh, at, the, at that time, they called uh, Jerusalem the throne, of, uh, the throne of the Lord. And all the nations shall be gathered unto it to the name of the Lord of Jerusalem. Neither shall they walk any more after the imaginations of their evil hearts. Because there is no evil in There is no going to be evil in heaven. There's not going to be, like I said, a lot of things that we endure down here things that we have to worry about, there'll be no evil in heaven. We don't have to worry about somebody coming in our house and, and shooting us or killing us and, and those kind of things. Because all of us worry about those kind of things. Or some of us do. I do. You know, somebody breaking in your house 
and maybe trying to take your life or, or steal your car or do those things. But what well, there, there ain't going to be none of that. Because God's in control of all that. And he's given us, going to give us a life that we never have to worry about again. Because there'll be no evil there. All nations and people will worship Jesus Christ. Revelations 7, 9, and 10 says this. After this, behold, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindred and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white clothed robes and palms and palms in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. That's going to be what we're doing. That's what we're going to be all part of. It's worshiping Him. The triumphal entrance, entrance mentioned in the gospel portrayed Jesus riding in on a donkey into the city of Jerusalem, and the Jews had lined the streets with their cloaks, waving palm branches, and praising God for the miracles that they had seen and heard and God had performed. When we they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, they took the palm branches, remember? The palm branches, and they went out to the city, and they cried out to him, Hosanna! Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. I can remember when we were having our, our plays at the, at the other church, and I can remember one of the scenes was when we had those palm branches, and when Jesus came into the came down and walked down the aisle, we would take those palm branches and lay them down at his feet. You know what? We're going to be doing that again. But this time it's going to be for real. That's right. We're going to be laying them at his feet and laying on there and, and, and wanting to thank him and saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. However, however we see Jesus, Jesus saw them. You know, when he saw them, when he first came into the city, the Bible says that he wept. He wept for he knew they did not. They didn't truly understand who he was and what was really going on. And so, you know what? And when he had come, into, uh, the verse says, and when he come, and when he came near, and he beheld the city and wept over it, saying, "If thou hadst known, even thou, at least, at least his, this day, the things which be, behold unto the peace, and but now ye are hid from mine eyes. In heaven there will be no confusion." There's going to be any confusion there because the Prince of Peace will be there. He's going to be in charge of all that. Every saint from every tribe, every tongue will be clothed in white clothes and white raiment and waving palm branches of genuine and genuine praise. Salvation belongs to our Lord who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And again, I go back to uh, the, the play time that we had there uh, at the church. And all of us were wearing white robes. And I can remember seeing all that. And remember seeing Jesus uh, uh, coming down the aisle and us being, all of us being in the white robes. And that's just going to be, you know, when Jesus comes back, that's going to be okay. And when we get to go to heaven, we're going to be able to see all those things that he's for us. Heaven will be filled with peace and joy and praise. Revelation 7, 15 through 17 says this. Therefore are they before the throne of God and serve him day and night in the temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. Think about that. He's going to be sitting there with us. Seeing us. We're going to be worshiping him, but he's going to be there with us. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst anymore. Neither shall the sun shine, uh, sunlight on them, nor any heat. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them, and shall lead them into living fountains of water. And God shall wipe away, wipe away all tears from their eyes. You know, when we get to heaven, the Bible says that He's going to wipe away all tears from our eyes. There's going to be times, you know, things that we've, we've seen, heard, and been involved in. But you know what? God says, don't worry about that. Because I'm going to take all the tears. And I'm going to wipe them away from your eyes. And you don't have to see those things. Don't worry about them anymore. Those who have come out for the great tribulation will remain before the throne of God forever with joy peace and adoration and adoration they'll serve him night and day people say well I don't know what I want to do that I want to do it I want to serve God anytime I get a chance to when I get that I want to do exactly what he wants me to do we've got we've got people that have gone before and I think Shirley used to say that with Dennis you know he's up there trying to put the chariots on the wheels the, the, the wheels on the chariots right because they're not they're not working right and, you know, God's taking people, and I don't know what he's doing up there, and you don't either. But you know what? 
there's so much going on that God has people going to help him and maybe doing things that he wants them to do. And one day we're going to be able to do those things. And those that come out of that great tribulation will remain with them on the throne forever and ever and ever. Jesus, the good shepherd, will lead them to the fountains of the living water. Never to thirst again. Aren't you glad you never, you never have to thirst again? How many of you ever been so thirsty that you could you could drink enough water? Yeah. I mean, I've been to that point sometimes. You know, you, you get so hot out there in the yard or, or where I used to work at, be on the roof somewhere, and it'd just be so hot on the roof out there, and you couldn't you couldn't drink enough water because you were sweating it out just as fast as you were drinking. But you know what? God says you'll never thirst again because He says I'm going to take care of you with the living water. Every tear be wiped away by his merciful hand. And every rest, the rest and shade of his presence. Didn't we read that, that uh, instance about being under the under the wings of the, 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 the eagle or the, the rooster or whatever? And you'd be underneath his wing, the hen, and be underneath the yeah, be underneath the sea. And that's what it, that's what he, that's what uh, the hens do. They gather their chicks under their wings. God's going to do the same thing for us. He's going to gather us under his wing. And he's going to take care of us. He's going to watch out for us. I imagine the saints will be there uh, just as much, have much joy. I, I think about that song of, of 10,000 years of serving God. And we've just begun. We're just beginning. It's just beginning. Think about, I think about the, the, the eternity and how long eternity is. I'm thinking about the sand that's on the sea, the sand that's on the beaches, the sand... If you were to count every single molecule of sand, that would you begin to talk about how long eternity is going to be. Eternity is forever and ever and ever and ever. That's so much to think we can thank God and look forward to because I love that hymn. We're going to be with him for 10,000 years, and it's just begun. And for him forever and ever. And so it's so important that we understand that. We're going to live with him forever and ever. The measurements of heaven. I was looking at that this week. And trying to go over in my head, try, try to get a grasp of it. You know, sometimes you know, we read the Bible that says, you know, 2,000 or whatever, 1,400 or 14,000 miles or whatever. So anyway, but the Bible in Revelation 21, 15 through 21 describes heaven as a city called New Jerusalem and with the following measurements. Think about the following measurements. The size of heaven, a perfect cube. A perfect cube. You know what a cube is? It's the, it's the height and the width and length, all the same size, all the same size, a perfect cube, each side measuring 12,000, or 14, uh, static, or 14,000 miles, makes it about 2,225 kilometers in length and width and height, and that's the city. That's where we're going to go live. That's what God has made for us to go be in and to go live at. The distance from Houston, Texas, to North Dakota, it takes 22 hours and six minutes to drive there, to drive from, that's 14,000 miles. The distance from our house in Stewart Strath to Colorado, the driving time is 23 hours and 16 minutes, as high as some of the mountain peaks in Colorado. That's how tall it is. That's how wide it is. How long it's gonna to take to, to go from one place to another. Now, I don't know whether we're gonna have jet packs or whatever when we go there. But God's going to give us something special that we can do and go as many places as we want to go. And he's going to be able to help us to do that and give it to us. The walls are 144 cubits high or about 200 feet made of jasper and, and decorated with decorated with precious stones. There's a, wall in, there's a wall in Denmark around a power station there that's about 200 feet tall. Think about it. A wall that's 200 feet tall. Now, it's 14,000 14, miles, right? And yet that wall is 200 feet tall. And each, each one of them will have foundations, and each one of them is going to have layers of different things in it. And so and as we think about that, heaven will be a, uh, a gate with pearly gates and streets of gold. Revelations 21, 21 says, the, excuse me, 12 gates were 12 pearls. Each individual gate was one pearl. One pearl. And the streets of the sea was pure gold. Have, like transparent glass. The gates, the, the gates, the Bible in Revelation 21 describes the New Jerusalem as having 12 gates. Going to have 12 gates, each made of a single pearl, a single pearl, and 12 angels guarding the guard, guarding the gates. 
The gates face every direction, and the names of the 12 tribes of Israel are written on them. The gates are always open. You know why they're always open? Because he said, come on, come unto me. Come on in. All you got to do is accept me and come in. Representing in the invitation of everyone to experience God's wonderful grace. Some Christians and denominations refer to the, uh, the gateway of heaven as the pearly gates. Well, they're pearls, right? They are the pearls there. And so it inspires them by that uh, definition uh, of that. Foundation stones, 12 huge foundation stones. The foundation stone of the wall of the city were garnished with all manner of precious stones. And I don't even begin in uh, jasper, uh, sapphire, uh, sa uh, emeralds. Uh, there's just so many different things that it's made up of pearl and topaz and different things. I was trying to look up the pronunciations of all those uh, the different the different gems that are going to be in there. And you know it's amber and all those things. There's a lot of different stones that are going to be that are going to be in there. It's going to be made up of. I recently read a, a historical account in the book, a, a history book, that described that the early colonialists discovered of the shores of the Chesapeake Bay giant oysters so numerous that they covered the ground like stones were waiting in abundance for the weary traveler. Many of them contains pearls such as the colonials and they delighted in seeing those kind of things. Think about the visualize a pearl. You know how pearl, right? How many of y'all got pearl necklaces? Yeah, yeah, I do. Anyway, so, but you know, think about the pearls. But think about a pearl that's just so big that it's the size to, to be one of the gates. A visual that the pearl gates of heaven being formed out of one pearl. Being formed out of one pearl. Un it's unfathomable. Because I can think about, and I, I, I'm going to the, because we used to live in Chesapeake, and you could go out there and get oysters, right? And you open up some of those oysters up, look inside, and you get a pearl out of them. Just think. Can you imagine an oyster came out of I don't, I don't think so. God's going to create that. But anyway, it's going to be, it's just, they're, they're going to be made of such beautiful pearls, unfathomable streets of gold so pure that they're transparent. Transparent will exist in the, from the 12 gates. That's a beautiful description of the what's going on in heaven. Uh, I was, when I went, used to go hunting all the time, we used to go up into the mountains and you get these creeks and some of those creeks would be so crystal clear that you, you could drink out of them. I mean, I used to drink out of them, but they'd be so crystal clear that you could look down and see through them. Can you imagine being crystal clear? Gold being so crystal clear that you can look through and it'd be so transparent that you can see through it because it's the way the Bible says that's what it's going to be. That exists from the 12 gates and it's going to be such a beautiful thing. Revelation 21 goes on to say that in heaven there will be no more sun and no more moon. We don't need them. Now you think about the moon and you think how big the sun is out there today. How big it is. And it won't be there because God's going to be the light out there. He's going to be the light of the moon there. The glory of God and the light of the Lamb will be illuminating that whole city. Wow. Because you know, you know how much the sun lights, you know how much the moon lights, but you think about God lighting up that whole city because he's uh, so bright and standing will be so, so shining. The city has no need of the sun nor the moon to shine in it. The glory of God illuminates it. The Lamb and its light and the nations of those who are saved shall walk in its light. We're going to be walking in, in the light of that. And the kings of the earth bring in their glory and their honor to him. All of us will be bringing our honor and our glory to him. The streets are paved with pure gold, just like, like I said before, clear crystals. It's going to be clear as glass to see through. The Bible also makes that heaven is big enough to contain an unnumerable multitude. Unnumerable. We don't know. We don't know how, long, how, how many people will be able to fit in there that God has prepared. Now, we don't know about all the people that are going to go and they're not going to go. But you know what? He's prepared that place to take care of as many people as will accept him and, and believe in him. Jesus leads. He's one day he's going to lead an army clothed in white on a white horse. He going to be something. And I saw heavens open, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon it was called faithful and true, and righteousness doth judge and make war. His eyes were as flame of fire. Flame of fire. And on his head were many crowns, and he had a name 
written that no man knew but him himself. He knew it. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, riding on a white horse, faithful and true. The Lord Jesus will ride from heaven with his army, dressed in white, the King of kings, wearing those crowns when ultimate come to judge the nations with eyes like the flame of fire, like righteousness will penetrate every single part. His, his, his eyes will just penetrate. You know, I always thought, you know, we were going to come back and, and want to help him, okay? But you know what? We ain't going to need our help. All he's going to have to do is speak it. He's just going to say, you know what? Satan and the armies of God, uh, the armies of, the, of the hell and all those all that during that time, he was just speak the word. We're not going to have to use swords and stuff like all that because just this, just his tongue would be enough to tell everybody, you know what? Things are going to go down now. And so he's just going to speak it out and things are going to happen. There will be no mistake about who Jesus is or what he has done. His role, his role will be dipped in blood, will be a testament of his perfect sacrifice on the cross. And every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Just think about that. There will be nobody who, won't be able, who will not have to bow before the Lord because they will see him and they'll automatically bow before him because of who he is. Wouldn't you, wouldn't you if you were part of that, and you see his eyes, you know, eyes, eyes of flame and, and a head with crowns on him and, and his name was written there and his clothes the vesture dipped in blood and his name was called the, the word of God and the armies that were in heaven followed him with the white horse. Can you imagine being on a white horse coming back to heaven, coming to heaven to fight me or just to be beside him? But you know what? He's going to take care of everything. We're not going to have to be involved in any of that because he's going to take care of it because he's God and he's the one that's going to do that. There will be no mistake about who Jesus is or what he's done. His robe dipped in blood will be a testament of his perfect sacrifice on the cross. And again, every name will bow. And every time will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Therefore, God also hath highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. That in the name of Jesus, every name will bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. And every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Everyone will bow before him. No one will say, I'm not bowing for him. Because you know what? He just has to speak for you. I guess he would just have to look at you and say, you know what? You're going to bow before me. And they did. And they will bow before him and confess that he is Lord. Precious gemstones will adore, also adore heaven in Revelation uh, 21, 19 to 11. And there came to me one of the heaven, seven angels, which had the seven vials full of seven uh, last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, and I will show thee the bride, the lamb, the lamb's wife. And he carried me away, and he was talking about Paul, uh, John, he carried him away in the spirit of the high and the most high into the mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God and her light with light unto the stones most precious, even like the jasper stone, clear as crystal. It's incredible. It's absolutely incredible the rare stones that are gonna that are gonna be there. There's one stone that was called uh, Terafite, which is to was discovered in uh Sir Last in South Africa in nineteen forty five, which then only it was like there was only a handful of those stones ever seen, never recovered, and they were when they were found. This rare seen beautiful makes this one of the most highly sought after and the most famous. The sun is going to be all over the city. And every time we see something, it's going to be different. And it's all there for us to see. And it's all there for our, uh, us to be involved in being around. And so, in heaven, the light of the city of Jerusalem will be like a glorious stone, shining pure like crystal. Its radiance, like sunlight, uh, outshine any, any precious gem on earth. And its value will be immeasurable. The stones will just be costly. Covered in the glory of God, the holy Jerusalem will descend with its brilliance out of Zion, the perfection of beauty. God will shine forth out of that. And they will see him. Every treasure, listen to me, every treasure that man holds value will hear, will 
pale in comparison to the magnificent city of heaven and all the things that he has. Just think about that. There are people out there that have diamonds and, and ruby, and some of these people have all these precious stones, and they think, wow, I've got it. I'm, I've got it made. And I've got all these precious stones. You know what? They're going to be worthless when you think about what Jesus said. Oh, he's going to show us what he did say. So it's just so important for us to understand. Everything that we have, even the streets of gold, are going to be perfect. The tree of life is in heaven in Revelation 22. Too. In the middle of the street and on either side of the river, uh, inside of the river was the tree of life, which bore 12 fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. In a world that's riddled with sickness and disease and uh, and the description of the and the description of the tree of life in Revelation 22 is a beautiful reminder that there will be no more suffering or pain again. It's just a reminder to see that God is going to show us that we're going to have to worry about it. no more sickness and no more help, uh, no more no more problems that are happening in our life because uh, the tree of life is there and the leaves are there on the tree of life. Now, the fruit of the tree, which will which will line the center of heaven's golden street, will be continuously available. And it'll be there in abundance. There'll be no more searching for the cures for diseases known to man. Every ailment will be remedied by the leaves of the trees, and the nations will be healed, will healed once for all and for all times. You know what? We don't have to worry about any of the anymore. There are people out there every single day trying to, to come up with a heal, uh, trying to come up with a cure for different things. People coming up and trying to find a cure for cancer. People trying to find a, a cure for Alzheimer's. People trying to find a cure for, like Bill was talking about Sunday. All, all these things, they're, they're trying to make uh, all the ailments that are out there in the world today. Guess what? There'll be no more ailments mm. in heaven. We'll know everybody. I mean, you talk about the Alzheimer's and different things that are going on and people not knowing who they are. But when we get to heaven, you're going to know everybody that you need to know. And God's going to be there for you. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the church. To him who overcome, I will give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of paradise. He's going to give that to us to be able to eat on. The light of God in heaven. Revelation, I'm almost done. Revelation 22, 4 and 5 says this. And, there shall, and they shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. And there shall be no more night there. No more night. They need no lamp, nor light of the sun, for the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever with him, forever and ever. In heaven, the light of the great city of Jerusalem will be the glorious stone, our, our Lord Jesus Christ, shining pure and like crystal. Its radiance will outshine any previous gem on earth, and its value will be immeasurable. Covering the whole glory of God, New Jerusalem will descend brilliance out of Zion, the perfection of a beauty God will shine forth. His beauty is going to shine forth. We wouldn't be able to see that. Every treasure, every treasure that we see and we hold on, think we hold, can hold on to, is not going to be worth it. Put the plug in. I like that song, and I, I, I sang it before, but song's called I Can Only Imagine. I Can Only Imagine by Mercy Me. Beautiful and describes one man's awe as he finds himself side by side with Jesus. Side by side with him, surrounded by the magnificent glory of God, shining bright, brighter than the sun. These lyrics inspire us to try to imagine the beauty of the final meaning of Jesus. Finding me of Jesus face to face. I can only imagine. Can you imagine? I can't imagine. I can't imagine uh, spending time and being with Jesus. But I know what? As a Christian, I know that's where I'm going. And I know that I'm going to see him face to face. And I'm going to be with him in heaven. And he's going to probably, yeah, he's going to take care of all these things that he says he's going to take care of for me. And yeah, I know he will. I don't know about you, but I'm ready to get it. I'm ready to meet him. And I'm ready to meet the Savior. To receive his name on my forehead as a stamp of approval and acceptance. It's just unimaginable to be able to do that forever and ever. He will rule and reign. We're going to rule and reign as joint heirs with Jesus Christ. 
every beautiful description of heaven will come to fruition. Everything that this Bible has to say, everything that we read and understand, and far exceeds any of our great expectations. Because we, I have not seen, ear hath not heard, all that he has, he has prepared for us. He who testifies of these things says, Surely I come quickly. And he's coming back. He's coming back quickly. He's coming back to take us home, to be with him forever and ever. Amen. Even so, come Lord Jesus. That ought to be our prayer. Every morning, every night, any time during the day, even so, come Lord Jesus. Look, all, all of us probably don't want to be on that next list, right? We always say we don't want to be. And you know what? A person that's drowning, a person that's, that's dying, what's the first thing they do? What do they say? Oh, my God, save me, right? You know what? For we as Christians, we can look to God and say, okay, God, I'm ready to get him. I'm ready to get him. Years ago, years ago, I asked this man down. I had a, had, a, had a problem with anxiety attacks. Really, really bad. I mean, I would get in the car and I'd drive to the hospital. It was so bad. And I'd say, you know, I, I can't I can't fix this. I don't know what's going on. How am I going to go out and fix this thing? And one day, one day I said, Lord, I can't do this on my own. And I can't do this by myself. But you know what? He laid it on my heart and laid it on my mind. He says, if something happens to you down here, the next breath you take is going to be with me. And that made me think, wow. And you know what? Ever since that time that he put that inside of me, I've never had a problem with it again. Because I said, Lord, it's in your hands. And you got it. And so after that, to worry about again. But you know, sometimes we're, we're, I was talking to a lady today about the baggage that we have. We, we, we tell God, I'm going to give you this, I'm going to give you this, I'm going to give you this. And then when we give it to him, we take it right back. And we don't give it to him all the way. You know, every problem that we have in our life, we can give it to Jesus. And Jesus promises he's going to help us get over it. He's going to take care of it. But you've got to be willing to give it to him and let him handle it. And when you do, you'll see the difference. So difference in your life. When you do that. Father, thank you for loving us. Thank you, Father, for being here tonight for an opportunity to serve you. This pray, my Lord, as we start to think about heaven, think about all the things that are there, think about all the things that we're going to be doing when we get there. It's just going to be such a great and wonderful time seeing our friends and our loved ones and, and seeing all those that went on before us, Paul and Peter and, and just John the Baptist and all these other people that we'll be able to talk to. Lord. That's going to be just a grand time. But most of all, Lord, we think we'll be able to see you and spend time with you forever and ever. And Lord, we thank you for that. Now go with us, Lord, as we go back to our respective places tonight. Give us, a, give us safety travel, Lord, as we head home. And Lord, help us to have a great rest of the week. And just be with those that are sick, one on our prayer list, Lord. We pray that you just be with them and touch them tonight, Lord. And put a special healing on them, Lord, and just be with them. Go with us. In your name we pray. Amen.